Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking the organizers to giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on this important subject. Uh, manufacturing, employment and poverty. I'm going to structure my presentation in four sections. Firstly, a uh, few words about motivation and the context within which we have to uh, treat, uh, discuss this issue. Then I'm going to discuss how manufacturing contribute to poverty reduction through the employment linkage. And thirdly, uh, opportunities and prospects for uh, low-income countries. And then I, I tried to draw some inferences relating to policy options for G10 uh, uh, development agenda. As uh, Dr. Hoda mentioned, and again, this was highlighted by uh, Dr. Ahuldu Alia in his uh, speech, uh, crowding out the uh, G10 uh, ten ad agenda by adding manufacturing as one key area can be counterproductive. But there are ways in which manufacturing can be related to the existing uh, areas which have been identified uh, for policy action under uh, G10, uh, G10 de development agenda. For instance, infrastructure can be well targeted towards uh, trade related uh, infrastructure development and human capital development can be targeted towards needy capital development uh, instead of just considering broad capital development, uh, human capital development. I'm going to elaborate on these things at the end of my presentation. Now, I'm going to aim at achieving two objectives in my presentation. Firstly, what is the potential role of manufacturing in employment generation and poverty reduction, uh, specifically in low-income countries. In this debate, putting all countries in one basket can lead to misleading inferences. My focus is on low-income countries. Then how initiative to promote manufacturing growth can be built into, instead of crowding out, the G20 agenda. Then the context for the discussion is, in fact, the long-running debate in the post-war period about the role of industry and industrialization policy. Uh, now, uh, as you have, when you follow the development literature, uh, generally development thinking is prone to fashion. Always you see pendulum shifts in the development thinking. In the first four decades, decades in the post-World War period, it, it was almost taken for granted uh, the manufacturing employment poverty nexus. Uh, key emphasis was on manufacturing. Then poverty was not explicitly stated simply because by generating employment, you inject money to the poor. I mean, that's the long-term way of addressing the poverty issue. For some reason, from about early 1990s, uh, th this uh, nexus, employment, uh, manufacturing employment poverty disappeared and people have started talking about growth and poverty. Partly because of this came from some uh, World Bank studies by Ravel and Sen and others. The, basically, they regress poverty rates across countries at the sectoral level. Naturally, since poor people are concentrated in agriculture, you see a positive relationship, right? And then interpreting that causation was a big mistake at that time. And all these things led to uh, ignoring the manufacturing or sectoral focus, but focusing simply on growth. Ignoring the fact that a given rate of growth can have different poverty outcome, depending on the sectoral composition, as well as the uh, growth conducive nature of the uh, development strategy. But recently, again, economists uh, usually recognize their mistakes with a time lag, right? Now, uh, there is renewed emphasis on employment in recent years, uh, shifting the pendulum to the original position. I think it's a healthy uh, 
development, even though it had come a bit late. Uh, now, the basic idea coming up in the development debate is premature industrialization uh, is a threat to employment creation and poverty reduction. Here, the term premature industrialization means shrinking the employment share of manufacturing at an early low income level. If you look at the data reported in uh, table one in the handout, you might see it later on. In many African countries uh, and some Asian countries, manufacturing share has declined uh, in recent years, even though still they are in the low income stage. That is a policy uh, mistake. Uh, that premature industrialization can lead to aggravating the poverty uh, situation in countries. Recent evidence uh, has come from many studies. One uh, uh, contrast which is highlighted in this debate is China-India comparison. Both countries have achieved more or less same rate of growth. China has been growing at about 10%, India also closer to it, right? But when you look at the poverty outcome, there's a dramatic difference between the two countries. The basic reason is that in China, their policies were more directed towards generating uh, employment for uh, poor people, low uh, skill and middle skill workers through manufacturing expansion. In India, uh, as Vijay Josi has written, uh, manufacturing growth in the formal sector has been basically employmentless uh, compared to Chinese experience. Then let me pass on to the second section. Uh, what is the nature of this relationship? When you want to understand this relationship, firstly, we need to discuss the direct impact. Secondly, the uh, spillover or indirect impact. Now, the key point here is that compared to agriculture and informal services, manufacturing has greater capacity to create relatively better jobs for unskilled and semi-skilled workers. This is a historical fact. And uh, in other words, employment in manufacturing requires mostly on-the-job training, unlike uh, uh, high profile jobs in the software industry in India. You need college education or above to do well in that sector. But that is not the case with manufacturing. And again, in agriculture, in manufacturing in particular, traditional labor intensive industries contribute disproportionately to create jobs for women. Plenty of evidence from countries around the world. In other words, when you consider women empowerment objective, uh, export-led industrialization contribute massively. The, that is the number story, number of workers attracted to, to manufacturing. At the same time, there is a reason to argue that labor productivity growth is generally faster in manufacturing. When you combine the two points, number increases, at the same time labor productivity increases, that means combined impact would be poverty reduction. And uh, in our ongoing work, uh, my work with uh, Kunal Sen, we find a positive <coughs> relationship between poverty reduction and manufacturing expansion, provided manufacturing expansion is export-oriented. Then indirect impact, again, uh, one of the uh, previous speakers referred to employment share in manufacturing. Actually, it does not tell the uh, total story. If you look at manufacturing share, no country in the world currently has got manufacturing employment share of 20%. But that is a gross underestimate simply because manufacturing had the possibility to create jobs indirectly, the linkage effect. Uh, according to recent studies, one job in manufacturing creates two to three uh, jobs in other sectors. According to my calculations, you can input output technique, even in Korea or Taiwan, employment share has not declined. And then, uh, again, three key points here. The magnitude employ of employment and poverty, in fact, differ by, by stage of uh, development. 
the direct employment effect is far greater in low-income countries, simply because in low-income countries, uh, most of the labor force is uh, concentrated in low productive agriculture and informal services. Therefore, manufacturing growth creates a wind for this surplus labor, as Sir Arthur Lewis predicted uh, 50 years ago. Uh, then, higher level of income, naturally, <coughs> capital and technology intensive production become more important, then the employment elasticity tends to decline. Therefore, when you run a regression relating employment potential and manufacturing, you need to allow for this non-linear effect, right? Uh, initially, strong positive relationship. When income level increases, the uh, impact taper. Uh, this uh, diagram indicates, basically, the relationship between poverty uh, rate, which is people below $1.25 uh, a day, and the uh, uh, manufacturing share in GDP, uh, which basically capture mostly direct effect. Even if you consider direct effect, there's a negative relationship between manufacturing expansion and poverty reduction. Uh, we are trying to estimate this relationship uh, uh, better by incorporating the nonlinear effect and so on. Then uh, when we discuss about policies, uh, we need to exactly identify what are the opportunities available for developing countries. Manufacturing growth is not a homogeneous and blunt instrument. It is a differentiated instrument. Different countries have opportunities in different product areas. We need to identify this clearly uh, for policy purpose. Now I'm going to skip these two slides, three slides. The point here is that the long-running debate with, uh, about virtues of import substitution industrialization and uh, export-oriented industrialization is virtually gone. Now, everybody now agreed, not only mainstream economists, but also revisionists, the old-style import substitution strategy uh, which erect tariff barriers and try to promote industry within your own border is virtually gone. Uh, one of the strongest critic of uh, uh, the mainstream economist, Danny Rodrigue, has this uh, statement to say, openness to trade is a friend of economic development and growth, not an enemy. As many policymakers the, and economists had feared in the intimate period, in, in, uh, into period. Now, but the debate is about uh, the policy mix. What policies are needed to achieve more export orientation? Again, export orientation does not mean ignoring production for the domestic market. Achieving efficiency to compete in world market naturally implies that you can do better in the domestic market as well. Uh, after skipping this slide, I want to come up with a typology which would help you to understand the areas where uh, low-income countries have uh, opportunities. Uh, for the purpose of the discussion, instead of considering manufacturing as a homogeneous phenomena, I would like to divide product lines uh, into three subcategories. Firstly, you have resource-based manufacturing or manufacturing activities which involve further local processing of uh, material previously exported in uh, raw form. Then you have traditional labor-intensive in product, and most of you know uh, opportunities in this area, clothing, footwear, and toys. In fact, in Indian policy debate, including in uh, Professor Panagaria's book, the entire focus relating to export-led industrialization has been focused on these two, uh, this uh, item. Uh, the first item and the second have been ignored in the policy debate. Therefore, I'm going to focus more on first and the third one, sorry. Now, the third item here, I would call it global production sharing. 
which is component production and assembly within uh, uh, vertically integrated global industries. Uh, now, there's a lot of misconception relating to resource-based uh, manufacturing, particularly in Indonesia at the at moment, one of the G20 countries, government is trying to promote local processing of everything in, uh, by imposing export tariffs <coughs> on material exported in raw form. They try to promote local processing. I think this is going to be a dead end strategy uh, for two reasons. Firstly, most processing activities, particularly those in mineral and chemical industries, are characterized by high capital and human capital intensity. And uh, many uh, are not therefore suitable for locating in low income countries. When you erect tariff barriers, artificial incentives might cr be created, but they are not going to have a lasting impact. Second and most important point, if you look at the uh, processing trade, iron and steel production and all that, the, these processing activities are concentrated in countries like Korea, Taiwan, uh, 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 Japan, or currently in China, uh, where you have scale economy advantage and other relevant factors. Therefore, if you consider a single country like Indonesia, uh, scale economy consideration uh, may run counter to the objective of expanding these industries. However, there is a big qualification. There is one product area uh, which provides a lot of opportunities for low-income developing countries to expand export-oriented growth, which is agro-based processed food. Now, if you look at data relating to world food trade, there has been a massive palpable shift in the composition from food items which were exported in raw form, like coffee, tea, in bulk, and all that, towards processed food, uh, ready to eat, uh, agro-based uh, vegetable, canned pineapple, tuna, and all these products. Uh, if you get, try to get a, an example closer to home, in Thailand, out of total manufactured export, 35% is basically processed food, right? And then, this is a structural phenomena. You have three minutes. All right. This is a structural phenomena uh, driven by internationalization of food habit and various other factors. Again, processed food trade has a lot of development conducive features, including labor intensity in the production process. Uh, again, the strong rural economy linkage, which help countries to shift income from urban sector to rural economy, and so on. Now, relating to processed food export, there are many uh, preconditions, but the most important policy challenge uh, faced by developing countries is meeting uh, international food safety standards. Uh, they are called SPS, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Unlike in tariff, you can't talk about eradicating SPS standards because they are built into health requirements. Therefore, what is needed is to develop supply side capabilities <coughs> to meet international food safety standards. You can go through the slides later here. Then I'm going to skip, skip traditional uh, uh, labor intensive production, uh, component production and assembly within vertically integrated production system is the most rapidly growing area in manufactured trade. Uh, the data clearly shows here, out of total manufactured exports from developing countries, almost 60% are basically network trade. Uh, East Asian countries, including China, are basically reliant on component production assembly as well as final assembly. Production bases are shifting from developed countries to the, these countries. Now, a feature, important feature of global production sharing is that it opens up countries to specialize in different segment of the production in line with their relative cost advantage. Uh, 
And again, uh, I have written a lot on this issue, power employment generation and poverty reduction in East Asia directly related to their engagement in production network. You will have to conclude now. Yeah. Then policy challenge uh, here is basically not only relative labor cost, but also uh, middle level manpower, not uh, high level manpower, supervisory manpower is very important in this area. Again, services link cost, that means cost related with uh, the link in production chain across countries, right? These things I have discussed here. Then I'll come to the uh, policy options for uh, G10 uh, agenda. Now, one key point I want to highlight. G20, G10. Pardon? G20? G20. It's G20, right? Yes. Yeah, G20 development agenda. Now, uh, in the discussions yesterday, always the focus was on growth. But my point is that both growth and type and nature of growth is important. When it comes to type of growth, actually manufacturing plays an important role. There can be two countries achieving the same growth rate, a lagger in manufacturing might have a poor employment and poverty outcome. Uh, then there's a need for uh, help in developing countries to improve supply side capability. I don't uh, believe in the role of FTAs or uh, the struggle for reducing uh, global tariff reduction. It's an ongoing debate, but countries develop even under existing tariff barriers. I'm not against reducing tariffs through supply side improvements. Now, uh, these are the two final points. There is a strong case uh, for designing G20 G development agenda with a focus on improving trade related infrastructure, including improving uh, supply side capabilities to meet SPS standard and reducing services link cost. Now, focusing on uh, infrastructure development uh, as a homogeneous phenomena and simply say, as it happened in many sessions yesterday, simply increasing infrastructure expenditure can be counterproductive. Politicians in developing countries hijack this for the purpose of trend seeking. Uh, the highest uh, investment to uh, in infra invest structure investment to GDP ratio ever recorded was in uh, Mobutu's siren, right? Uh, President Mobutu loved infrastructure simply because he had the opportunity to siphon off part of it to support the actors. It is happening everywhere. In Sri Lanka, uh, President's electorate has now got a new port, airport, and six lanes highways. Nobody uses them, right? This is the point. I think infrastructure focus of G20 can counter, be counterproductive if it is not well governed and targeted. Then middle level technical, when it comes to human capital development item in the G20, middle level and technical uh, managerial level skill development has to be a priority. Again, it should not be a blanket for prescription. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Let me call upon uh, Dr. Nagesh Kumar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers, uh, the ICRIER, for this very timely conference uh, and to uh, fit in the <coughs> program of the conference, the key issue of job creation and manufacturing job creation or manufacturing for job creation. And I'm uh, going to uh, actually a number of uh, very useful presentations have already been made 
Chandra has given a very detailed, very comprehensive uh, overview of industrialization. And, and before that, Mauricio and uh, Mr. Ajay Shankar have already spoken. A number of uh, you know, insights have been shared. So I'll, I'll just go over it very quickly. Basically, the job cre creation becomes a very critical issue, particularly for India, which is undergoing the demographic transition, as you know. Uh, we have a very youthful population, and it will continue to grow. Uh, the working age population's share will continue to grow in India for another 20, 25 years. And that means uh, this challenge of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, I think I, I'm seeing a slide somewhere. Nevertheless, yeah, I think I, I have uh, lost a slide, somehow it has blanked. But uh, what was on the slide is uh, this, uh, basically uh, the jobs question uh, is very intimately linked with the structural transformation. Uh, and India has had very dramatic uh, structural transformation, which is in the form of uh, very rapid, very dramatic decline of agriculture in GDP from upwards of 50% to uh, only 15% uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, by now. And uh, the sh what was the loss of agriculture has been largely taken up uh, by uh, services. And this kind of uh, structural transformation, which I call as services-oriented structural transformation, has given to India growth, very robust growth, but not uh, the uh, jobs in the same proportion. And so today you have in a very asymmetric situation where agriculture, which contributes to only 15% of GDP, accounts for, it still sustains more than half of uh, India's workforce. And if you know, 15% of GDP is divided uh, between, say, more than 50% of workforce. Obviously, productivity levels are very low, and that is the source of poverty and all other things. So we need to find a way to create uh, productive jobs for these uh, young people who are joining the labor force every year. Otherwise, this uh, demographic dividend that we, uh, you know, talk about can become very quickly a nightmare, uh, demographic nightmare. I think it's always something which is repeated off and on. India, among the uh, major uh, e developing economies, has one of the lowest uh, share uh, of manufacturing at uh, uh, only 13.5 percent. And it has actually come down uh, from, uh, you know, the peak was 17 point something uh, some years ago. And it has actually come down. So this is something uh, of a serious uh, matter. And the poor performance of manufacturing uh, in recent times is uh, what is actually responsible for uh, the growth slowdown and also uh, rising uh, trade deficit. Uh, trade deficit is essentially a mercantile deficit because in services, uh, sorry, uh, the current account deficit is essentially a mercantile trade deficit because in services we have a surplus which is uh, able to, uh, you know, uh, sort of counter or uh, mitigate some of uh, that deficit we have uh, in, in Mackandai state. And in 2013-14, uh, 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 I think uh, the Mackandai uh, state deficit was close to $200 billion, which is uh, really uh, very large. And if we were manufacturing many of those things that are imported, uh, there would be much lesser of uh, current account deficit. And uh, the industrial growth or manufacturing growth